Hello, everyone. Today, we are going to talk about large language models, about Langchain, about to how to make something more complex than a single prompt to chat GPT. We will be doing some coding. I will be showing you some examples. But we have just two hours, so I want to make sure that you don't get overwhelmed or you don't get too excited, because the code is actually quite simple. Um, and I'll be sharing some tips and tricks, lessons learned, lessons learned from, from the project we, we, we run in the past, because, you know, learning the code is, and learning the API is actually super easy, but then the more, the deeper you get into the, into the, the real problems, the, the trickier it becomes, so I'll be sharing those as well. My name is Marcin, I'm CEO at Tantus Data, at Tantus Data, we help our customers with pretty much everything data, from setting up data infrastructure through data engineering up to machine learning model, building them, training them, putting them into production. And let's get started with the use cases for large language models. I believe you are familiar with those kind of daily work use cases. So let's say you missed a very important meeting, you can ask ChatGPT to come up with an excuse for that. It can be even a, an excuse in the form of poem. A dragon flew in from sky so blue, demanded a chat. What else could I do? You know, it can generate images for you. You are all familiar with that, right? So you can use it to do email generation, you can do it for, use it for document creation, for summarizing the documents for you, for generating code, for doing code reviews, for writing tests for you. Actually, how many of you are using ChatGPT co-pilots on a daily basis? Okay. So I won't be going very deep into those kind of daily work use cases, but those are simple, those are, are you can do right away. I wanted to focus on some other simple use cases, so we won't start with building, I don't know, chatbot. We'll start some, with some other simple use cases, but use cases which are simple yet often forgotten, often missed. So you can very easily use a large language model to do sentiment analysis for you or to do text categorization for you. What? does that really mean? Let's say you are in travel industry and you collect some feedback from your customers about the apartment rentals, about the hotel, uh, hotel stays at the hotel. And you have those texts and they are super useful. You can go there, you can read them and understand what happened, why the customer is not happy. But the problem starts when you have millions of them and then you probably cannot read all of them. But at the same time, you would like to have some numbers, some statistics, get, get like how, how big percentage of the comments are positive, how big percentage of the comments for a given property are positive. So what you can do, you can run a basically batch code uh, delegated to GPT model to, to LLM and generate an extra com com column which says whether the comment is positive or negative. And from now on, you can very easily get numbers. Then you can also ask what exactly the customers are complaining about or they are happy about, what they are talking about, what they care about in general. So whether they care about the, the, the check-in, the food in the, in the hotel, what is it? So I'll show you, I'll introduce you to, to a, few, um, a few lines of code. But we won't be starting with Langchain yet, and that's why. I, but I will be still referring to Langchain. So let's start with a sim very simplistic definition of what it really is. So Langchain is a Python framework which helps you building Gen AI application with, with LLMs. So let's do some coding. I hope it works because I'm on my mobile, yes. Okay, so we have a bunch of boilerplate code here. 
some imports, some more imports. But it really, it really starts here where we export some environment or vari variables to be able to connect to, to OpenAI. And then we can actually do some imports of OpenAI libraries. So this is not Langchain yet. This is just Open OpenAI client. So we instantiate the client. We tell which model exactly we would like to use. And this is the first place we can, we can stop. Because if you are dealing with software, you always want to be very much up to date, to, to use the recent one. And if you want to use this kind of code for, for a playground, for what I'm doing now, it doesn't really matter. You can use the very recent version and you will be fine. And you top up your OpenAI account with, I don't know, $10, it will be enough for a year. But if you are about to use this code in production, it doesn't necessarily mean you want to use the most recent model because, because simply there are price differences. The most recent models are more expensive, they are better, but they are more expensive. And if you run it for millions of customers, you need to justify. You need to test and, and see which one makes sense. But then we are passing some messages. So we are passing the message from the user, but we are also passing a system message. So what is system message? As you can kind of guess, it's a message which is more important than the user message. It is a message which comes from you as a developer of this kind of system. And it's a hint for a, uh, for a system of how the large language model should behave. So if we have if we get two messages and they are contradicting, the message from user is contradicting to the system message, the system message should win. And the whole idea is that you can, by, the, by using the system message, you are supposed to define how the chatbot should behave, what it's allowed to do, and let's say prevent from doing something harmful by the user or to the user. But here we are not doing anything fancy, we say, you are a poetic assistant skilled in explaining complex programming concepts with creative flair. And then the user comes and says, compose a poem that explains the concept of recursion in programming. Make it short. And we are passing some extra parameters, and they are quite important. So let me switch back to the slides so we can, uh, we can understand them better. OK, so before I get into the parameters, there is one super important thing you really need to understand. The large language models operate on tokens. So if you ask, I don't know, ChatGPT to do something, it doesn't come up with an answer right away. It actually produces it token by token, word by word. And then each word has a certain probability, so it's likely that you will get two different responses for, for exactly the same call. And then in production applications, you usually want to control that. And one of the questions I was getting, why, why, do, why would you want to limit the creativity? Creativity is like the main property of, uh, of ChatGPT. That's what made it kind of popular, right? But if you are building a customer support application, you don't want to, to John and Mary come with exactly the same question and, and uh, them getting completely different answers. You, you want some consistent, consistency. So the first parameter to control that is called temperature. And it's basically how creative the model will be, how far from each other, th each other those probabilities will be. And let's say you want it to be somewhat creative, you set the temperature to, to a value higher than zero, but you don't want complete nonsense answers. And that's why we have another parameter called top probability. It's a, and it's about probability of tokens, probability of words. So let me give you an example. Let's say the large language model is producing a sentence. There was dark and silent, what? 
How, do, how would you compl complete that sentence? Night. Night. What else? Room. Room. Oh, good. Actually, two of them are on the slide. Uh, so let's say night, evening, room. Those make sense. Pringles? I'm not so sure. And let's say we set our top probability to 0.95. And let's say the probabilities of each of the words are 80, 10, 6, and less than 1%. So the, the first three, they actually sum up to something larger than 95. So only those will be selected. So by using this parameter, you basically cut off the long, the, the long, long, uh, long tail. And the last one is called seed. And probably you've seen this kind of parameter whenever you are dealing with any kind of random, num random number generation, but it doesn't exactly work like that, like with random number generation. Because with random number generation, if you pass the same seed, you will get the same sequence. But when you read OpenAI documentation, you can see that they say the seed parameter allows you to receive mostly consistent outputs. And you know, it's a bit ironic that you use the word consistent with the word mostly. Consistent is supposed to be a strong word, right? Um, but there is no guarantee. It, it works many times, but there is no guarantee, and I want you to kind of remember about, about that. Okay, so let's get back to the code and then let's try to run the code I was showing you. So we get lots of metadata here and here, but the actual output is here. In the realm of code, a loop unbound, recursion dances round and round. It's kind of, kind of yeah, it's, it rhymes, that's good. And when we run it once again, it looks exactly the same, at least the first lines. And the last word is endless affection. We run it again. So yeah, this time it seemed to be, it seemed to be consistent. But when we remove this, and when we put some other number here, we will get what? Okay, even the beginning of the sentence is different, we got something different. In the world of code, there, is, there lies a loop. In the land of code, a loop unfurls, whatever that means. Uh, but, but yeah, we are getting, uh, we control the creativ cre creativeness of the model. But so far, we are using just direct OpenAI API. The problem with that is that if you were to deal with Llama, so the large, large language model for, from Facebook, you won't be passing this, you won't be getting these kind of responses, you will be passing something completely else. You would have to come up with kind something XML-like or I don't know, whatever, whatever type of messages they came up with. So system message goes here, and then you need to open up those uh, tags, close them for user messages. And you could say, okay, it's not a rocket science, you can do that, but it's not, it's not a fun work to do the translation if in case, let's say, you want to try two different models. And that's why we will be starting with Langchain. That's one of the kind of the most obvious benefits of using Langchain. It hides this kind of complexities from you. You don't have to translate from one API to another one, it, it does it for you. So we're starting with Langchain here. We do, again, a bunch of imports. We are importing the chat OpenAI API, but a wrapper from Langchain. And we are importing a bunch, uh, bunch of objects, a bunch of classes, which are supposed to be um, basically the, the message wrappers. And let's write some first code in Langchain. So we will defi define the behavior of our chatbot, which will be 
you will be an expert at telling jokes. And I'm setting this variable because I want to show you that you can parameterize those mm, prompt templates. So we are building a prompt template, a system prompt template out of variables. We are also passing some human message, which is, hi, what's your name? Here we are simulating that we received a response from the AI, which was, hello, I'm an expert at telling jokes. What can I do for you today? And we are adding another message to that, to that list, which will be, tell me a joke about bear. We are creating an API. Once again, we generate the, uh, we, we def define the model. We define the temperature as before. Then on top of the ch chat API, to the chat API, we pass the prompt. We format the messages, which we pass the parameters we defined and we get the response. So what is the response? The response will be, again, an object of the AI message type with some content and some metadata. You can do response.content so it's kind of more readable. So the, the, the joke you're getting is, why did the bear dissolve into a puddle? Because he was polar. I don't know. You know, it's not it's not very very good at jokes. Actually, what what it does it does understand that multiple words can sound the same. So so it switches them between uh, and it's using that concept. The problem with those jokes is that very often they get translated to other languages. So what works in English, what kind of might be funny in English, it's not funny in Polish or German or whatsoever. But this is not really what we expect from the chat to, to, to come up with the jokes, so, so let's move on. Uh, what was the prompt we defined? The prompt, after formatting, is just a bunch of those objects. System message, human message, AI message, and human message again. So we can transform it to the format expected by chat GPT by, by OpenAI. So you can use the chat API and you can say, create message dicks if you want to see what it would look like if you send it to uh, OpenAI. But exactly the same prompt, exactly the same object you defined, you can use for, other, for another LLM. So you can use it, for instance, for Anthropic, which is a, an OpenAI competition. So we import another object from, from Langchain. We create, we instantiate the model. And then we say, okay, we want to format parameters. So we want to see what will be sent to Anthropic. What would happen if we send it to Anthropic? And here the format is slightly different. So if you compare those two, you can see that each message for OpenAI is like one JSON structure and each has the par property of of the role, whether it's system or user. With Anthropic, if you scroll all the way here, the system message is the top level message. So again, small differences, small differences which would be painful if you were to implement them yourself. Langchain is doing them for you. Okay, so I briefly mentioned the system prompt, but how powerful is it? How reliable is it? How deterministic is it? So I would like to show you some code we were showing in a workshop like half a year ago. And it was working. The problem is it's not working that well anymore. So that's the, that's the tricky bit. So what we wanted to show is that if you come up with a system prompt, which is just, you are an expert. You are an, you are Python expert. So you don't explicitly say that you care about not uh, producing harmful messages or something like that. And what the user is passing, it's just what is the output of the following Python code and the user is passing some code. And what we want to do here, we want to trick the model to, to, to think that it's, it's harmful. What we are actually doing, uh, what we are actually doing, we are just passing two variables with, with very weird name unethical racist data, harmful input, input, but end of the day, we are doing two plus two, and we expect 
the number four to be an output. And the way it used to work, it was always this prompt, you are a Python expert, it was always producing four. But if we borrow the, the, the safety prompt from, from Llama, you are helpful, respectful, honest assistant. Always answer blah, 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 blah. It should not include harmful, unethical, racist, sexist, toxic. You get the point, right? If we change the, the system prompt, we expected that it will prevent, that will, it will trick the model that it thinks it, there is something harmful in here and that it will, it will prevent us from printing four. It will say something like, I'm sorry, I cannot do that. But if we, if I run the code, in both cases now, I'm getting, I'm sorry, or the, the code provided is inappropriate. So what has changed is it's a big problem, like producing harmful input is a big problem for all those companies. So behind the scenes, they are adding some guardrails and they, uh, and, and they actually do what we, what we wanted to do during the demo. But the thing is like, if you run it multiple times, it's, it's much harder to present how powerful the system prompt is because it's always, the Python expert is still, uh, is still um, guarded by OpenAI. So OpenAI does not allow to produce four in most of the times, but if we run it, if we run it in a loop for multiple different temperatures and for each combination of the prompt, what we can do, we can have a look at the result, but not only that, it would be a good excuse for me to show you a tool called Langsmith. So I'm not sure, can you see the URL here? SmithLangchain.com. You can go there, you can create an account, you can connect your code to it. And the whole point of this tool is that it basically does logging of every single call we are making. And if we are m using the expert prompt, so you are a Python expert and we don't care about everything else, every now and then we are able to produce four. But if we do the safety prompt, so those are the safety prompts, I was not able to to produce four at all. So the safety prompt is still stronger. The, the, the guardrails on the OpenAI side doesn't always trigger. Um, but, but there is also this kind of lack of determinism you have to be aware of and also lack of, um, how you call that, um, guarantee that it will behave always, always the same. You, you using some API, you, do con you don't control what happens behind the scene and actually quite a lot was happening before. But what do we what do we have here? We have the name of the call, we have the input, output, we have also uh, some stats like latency, but also the cost is calculated here. So it's really useful when you when you want to understand what was happening over over time. All right, but I was showing you the sentiment analysis. Let's try to let's try to implement that. So I'm quickly came up with a prompt like you are an expert in sentiment analysis. Justify if the website comment text provided is positive or negative. Answer in one word: positive or negative. And we have a bunch of comments. In the real life, you probably would be pulling it from the database. You would need to have some connectors. But for the sake of the demonstration, let's just do a list. And then we are coming up with, with the prompt. So we are passing the system message. So this one, we are passing the comment itself, which we extract here. Here we are doing a loop. We invoke it on, uh, we invoke the chat API um, function with the prompt and we pass the variables. The variables are the, the comment itself, the system prompt, and we're printing the result. And this one was negative. Let's see. This place won't see 2018 out. Food is absolutely awful. So that was an easy, easy spot. It is negative. The other ones are positive. It's just, 
I just what I want to do here is just to show you that this is just one screen of a code, and you get that pretty much for free. You don't have to tune your own machine learning model because five years ago you could very easily, I mean, yeah, that's the problem, not very easily. You could tune your machine learning model, you can get a baseline model and maybe tune it for your data, data but still some tuning was necessary. This, I won't say you can do it within half an hour because still you need to verify the results, maybe you need to play with the prompt, maybe you need to run it multiple times and see the overlap and maybe verify the uh, where the, the overlap does not really does not really exist, but it's still much much simpler than it, than it used to be. So keep that in mind. Keep in mind that you can enrich your data by using these kind of tricks. All right. So just to sum it up, why do we why do we need a framework? The framework is super helpful in terms of abstracting all the various API complexities, but it also has a great community. And the great, great community is helping you with coming up with examples. It, it's, uh, it's helping you also with all kinds of connectors. So we'll be talking about later, but at some point you want to pull some extra data. You want to pull some extra data from your database, from, from Google, and all these kind of connectors are already implemented. You get them, you get them for free. And if you have these kind of connectors, you can kind of tackle the fact that the language models have still limited capabilities. They don't know about what happened yesterday because they were trained, I don't know, a year ago. They don't know about your specific company domain because hopefully they don't have access to that, right? But I also wanted to stress on the on the problems we've seen so far so it can make mistakes and i'm stressing on that simply because i believe that if you are dealing with with this kind of system you the fact that they make mistakes doesn't really mean that you should avoid them it's more like you need to be aware what can happen you need to justify the risk you need to take the safety measures to to prevent from the mistakes as much as possible, but also to you need to understand what will be the consequence of a mistake. And every now and then the behavior is changing, so pay attention to that. We will be talking a little bit about the open source which you can control instead of API, but let's leave it that for later. Okay, one more simple example before we jump into, into building, building the actual chatbot. Another use case I wanted to show is, again, super simple. It's about generation of training data. So our client came to us and, and he said, we want to have a job title classification. So if you have Java engineer, Java software engineer, Java developer, it's pretty much the same job. And you want to use the, the, the category to, to, let's say, target the, the ads, send the, the appropriate job, uh, job offer, and so on. So those three are the same, so they get the same number. And then JavaScript en uh, developer or JavaScript engineer. JavaScript is, is a different language, right? Not, not every recruiter knows that, but it's different. We want it to be different number. And the, and the client who came to us, he said, oh, we already have the model, we already have the training data, but for langu one language only, and we want to go to, to other markets. And what you can do very often with large language models is that you can generate translation, and LLMs are quite good at translation, but they were actually not that good with translating job titles, because job title is kind of very specific domain and uh, they, are, uh, they are not that good, but what we tried to do, what we did, we just generated the synonyms of the job title, like the main job title translation, so to see uh, how, how it would work. And if we try to... <coughs> if we try to implement that, 
it's again some ha some ad hoc prompt. You are an expert in job market. You will produce comma separated list of job titles synonyms provided by the user. The job titles are Java developer, JavaScript engineer, and carpenter. And I'm showing you the carpenter for a reason because we were getting super weird, uh, super weird results for that. And then everything else in the code is exactly the same as before. And when we run the code, we get a bunch of, so Java programmer, Java engineer, Java software developer are super good. Those are like, nah, maybe too, too generic. Then JavaScript uh, developer, front-end developer, web developer are quite good. And then carpenter, woodworker, carpenter's assistant, joiner. What's that? Huh? You see, it's good. I just don't know that word. Um, but this time is is good. But uh, what we what we saw, it was overall quite good. We were doing, we were running it multiple time times with multiple models, and we were taking the overlap, and then we were doing a verification. So what is in which cases the results of the model are incorrect, and there is some manual work to to, to do that. But it still speeds up the process of gathering, collecting, creating the, the training uh, the training data. And with the carpenter, the weird part was that when we asked, it was actually in Polish, so it's hard to translate, but we, when we asked for carpenter, it generated something like a knight of wood. <laughs> and you know, <laughs> you have to be aware of that. It could be a very a very fancy name for a job title in some startup, like, uh, I don't know, JavaScript Ninja or stuff like that. But, you know, it, it can produce weird results. Let's get back to the code. Because we are starting with the, with the chains, which is the kind of the main syntax of, of Langchain. So, we have exactly the, the same code as before, so far, with the expert at telling jokes, except that line. Before, what we were doing, we were doing chat API, open bracket, chat prompt, we format the messages, we pass the messages, uh, or the, the parameters, and so on. Here, we are defining a cha chain variable, and this is kind of the trick. This is the operator which we will be using a lot. So the, the meaning of this operator is that the output of this operation goes as an input here, and then the output of this operation goes as an input here. We use that variable chat chain here. We call invoke, which means that this goes as an input here. So that's pretty much the same code. It's just slightly different uh, and in long term more, more convenient way of writing it. And the only, the only caveat here is that we have two parameters, behavior and topic. But this syntax accepts only, only one. So you need to do do a wrap up. You wrap it up into Python dictionary or a, or map if you wish. We print the result. Why there's like fast food because they can't catch it. Yeah, fine. Uh, and then, if we are talking about not just a single prompt, a single prompt which is doing sentiment analysis or, or telling us a joke, if we are talking about the chatbot. There needs to be a concept of history, simply because if you write what is 2 plus 2, it will give you the answer 2 plus 2 equals 4. But if you, in the same conversation, ask what was the result, I forgot, then you won't get answer unless you handle history. So Langchain gives you some some kind of predefined ways of handling the history. This is the simplest one. So this is conversation chain where you define the LLM you want to use. And you define the memory object. 
and when you call that code, you can see that, yeah, it knows about the input, but it also knows about the history. And the history is pretty much the, the entire current conversation as is. Human, what is 2 plus 2? The AI response with 2 plus 2 equals 4. And the response would be the result of 2 plus 2 equals 4, even though we don't explicitly ask for that here. So it can handle it for, for the simple cases, but there are, there are problems with this kind of approach that you, that you store pretty much everything. First of all, the history will be growing. And the fact that it will be growing has consequences. One is you have to send more and more data to OpenAI. You have to pay more and more for each call. And the more and more uh, data is to be processed by LLM, it doesn't necessarily, it will be, it will yield better results because probably what you are looking for is somewhere, somewhere in between and everything else is the noise. So the, the more and more data you send, it actually limits the chance that it will understand what you're really looking for. But there are ways of, there are ways of uh, handling, handling the, the history we will be, we'll be talking about a bit more uh, sophisticated ways of doing that. That's what one of actually the, the challenge, like how do you handle the history for your specific use case? Uh, but here I wanted to, to take that as an excuse to implement our own history, to just present you one, once again with how the, how the chains work. So let's say we are defined a prompt we create a system message, which is your helpful chatbot. We put a placeholder for our history and we are able to pass whatever comes from the user, the question from the user. And then we define mod memory model and so on. And we create a bunch of functions. Get question and history, get answer and pass question through and update history. So we don't, we are not doing much here, but I want to show you that we are calling these functions in a chain. So when we call invoke, hi, my name is Bob. This goes as an input here. So let's see what is happening in that function. In that function, we don't do much. In that function, we just return the question itself but also we load the history. Sometimes you load it from memory, sometimes you load it. Let me just quit. What else was ramping? No, I don't know. Um, so we pass the question further and we also load the history and pass it further. So we pass this object here. Then within that function, we define another chain which is what we saw before. Prompt goes to the model and we parse the output. So here we are actually calculating the actual answer. We make an LLM call where we get the answer to the question we had and we still memorize the question so we can pass it further. And we have a function responsible for returning the result. So what user is interested in, but behind the scene, we also save the memory and you know i'm showing it to you just as an excuse to, to 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 repeat about how the chain is working but also that shows that you can write your own custom function to to handle to handle memory and when we invoke that once again hi my name is bob the, the answer to that was hello bob how can i assist you today and then I forgot my name. What is it? Yeah, your name is Bob. Is there anything I can help you with? All right. So we've been talking about history. We, we will be talking about history a bit more uh, later on, but let me introduce to the, to the one of the most popular concept in building LLM applications, building chatbots, which is called RAG. So we need a bunch of slides. And let's say we are building a chatbot. 
And let's say the user comes and asks a question, I need an apartment with elevator in London because it's a chatbot, which is a travel assistant. And the chatbot has like the large language model, the, the open AI, Anthropic, whatever, they have no idea about your current offer. They, they have no idea what's available, what's the pricing and so on. So we need to provide this kind of data to, uh, to your application. And the general idea is that you pull whatever you need. Whatever you need, I mean data from some PDFs, data from a database, data from an API. You pull that data, you format it, and you pass it as part of the prompt to a large language model. And this is called RAG. It stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation. And a very common concept, very common uh, term which is related to, um, to RAG and to LLMs in general is called vector embedding. So when you are in the bubble where, you, where LinkedIn, LinkedIn suggests you content about, about LLMs, very likely you will see the content about vectors. So what are they? The concept is actually quite simple. You have some text, some arbitrary text. You can transform the text into a vector, into a bunch of numbers. Why? The promise is that if two texts are similar in meaning, if they are close to each other, then the vectors produced by uh, by the vector embedding will also be close to, uh, to each other. So you can, by using the vectors, you can understand the similarities between the text. And there are a few more promises here. One of the promise is that even, oh, if you have king and queen, they're kind of the same job title, right? They differ in, uh, in, in the gender. So you are supposed to even be able to do the math like that, queen equals king minus man plus woman. At least that's the promise. The other example would be, let's say you have red, orange, yellow, they represent color, they should be close to each other, then car is somewhere completely else, but king and queen are somewhere completely else, but close to each other. So how do we use that in practice? If the customer comes and asks us ask a question, I need an apartment with elevator in London, you are looking for documents for data in your database, which is close to that question. So you hope, at least you hope, that the apartment with elevator in London will be closer to the question than an apartment in, apartment in London, but without an elevator, it will be closer to a cottage in Cornwall, it will be basically closer than anything else. One note here is that that's just a promise. That's a bit simplistic. Uh, and the other note is that when you are using this kind of search versus keyword search, the elevator would be working much better. So let's say you have a description which says elevator, but you are looking for a lift. The vector embeddings will be quite good at understanding those kind of semantic meanings. So in those cases, it works well. There are cases which, uh, which it's, it's not that good. I'll be showing you them later, but at least that is the, the promise. And what do you do next? You transform your data into the vectors. So you index your data with vectors. And then based on those vectors, you pull it from, from, from the vector database, you add it to the prompt, you continue. You, you, by doing that, you provide your LLM with an extra knowledge about your domain. And the vector database could be vector-specific database. There are like multiple, uh, multiple of them. Postgres has, a, has um, support for that, so you can play around. Aha, OK. And if we ask this kind of question, then we get a response, and then we say, OK, we cannot find anything with elevator. Elevator is kind of too restrictive, um, too restrictive requirement. Skip the elevator, but I need washing machine. What, what it really means, those two, two requests from a user, what's important is like it should be in London, 
it should be it should have washing machine. It has the word elevator in both cases, but we actually want to want to skip that. We could rephrase that question to I need an apartment with washing machine in London. We cannot mention elevator. We, we don't want to mention the elevator as well. So that's one of the reason keeping the full history does not make that much sense. That's one of the reason you want to do tricks like that. You want to kind of compress the question, the history to, to what's really meaningful in your case. So just, just to show you, just to pretty much repeat what I said, but with an example, like, So we are extracting a bunch of things here, like the property type, uh, the, 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 the town is, is quite important. But did I say, uh -huh, okay, I didn't say, okay, I need an elevator. So we are doing a bit more than, um, than I just described because we are not just rephrasing the question we are putting the most inf important information for us into a JSON. We have some other info, which is elevator. So I don't need elevator, but I need washing. So how exactly you do that, it's, it's really up to you, but, but there is like lots of experiments. We decided to, to have a predefined set of a uh, set of criteria which are very common, which, which we want to. So, so you see, it was it was other info elevator. We want to we want to override that. We do the free text as well, like free text rewriting of what the user said somewhere behind the scene. But we also keep the uh, keep the criteria here, so so it's a bit kind of better defined, and it has some schema, and it's easier to, for the model to actually. Uh, to actually come up with with this kind of criteria. Um, okay. So let's have a look at, at an example of how we could just rewrite the question. We define a prompt which is supposed to to basically do the question, do the condensed question. You have to long conversation and you want to rewrite it into the, the, the actual meaning of what user wants. So given the following conversation and the follow-up question, rephrase the follow-up question to be a standalone question. We want a standalone question. Why do we want that? Because um, if you, let's say our conversation so far is, how do I implement retrieval augmented generation with Langchain? And let's say the reply from the chatbot was, in Langchain, you can use predefined class conversational retrieval chain to implement retrieval augmented generation, blah, blah, blah. And then the user asks, how does it work? If you just want to look up in your documents the question, how does it work? I mean, it has no meaning. You need to know some context, and that's why you want to rewrite rewrite the question ha using this this context so what we do we give this hint rewrite the question to a standalone one the human message would be the actual question from the user as a follow-up input so this is our follow-up input and we want the standalone question to be an output and pay attention here even this colon is important here. So that's one of the tricks. Most of the models are trained in the way that if you put a colon at the very end, then it doesn't answer you with like, oh, certainly I can help you. This is your answer. It just goes straight to the answer. Um, and that's what, that's, that's what we want. And if we, if we run that code with how does it work, this how does it work will be rewritten based on that information to how does the convers conversational retrieval chain class work in Langchain for implementing retrieval augmented generation. 
So we have completely different pr question, and for this kind of question, we can actually we can use this kind of question to to actually look it up in in the Langchain documentation or whatever resources we have. If we search for how does it work, it won't give us results, right? Okay, but before we we actually uh, use this condensed question, let's let's have a look at a very quick uh, demonstration of uh, how um, how we do the embeddings. Doing the embeddings is pretty much related to to knowing what libraries to use, and and everything is implemented for you. So you can use OpenAI calls, so we can send your data to OpenAI and transform it into vectors. You can use open source classes like sent so there is sentence transformers. You select which exactly model you want to use, and you can you, you can use that as well. And then if we define the words we want to we want to change into vectors, you just make a call and you get the vectors. Then you need to, if you are using open source, you need to do a bit of linear algebra, linear algebra tricks because um, because you need to that they need to be normalized then we define bunch of bunch of helper functions for plotting for reducing the dimensions and we do the math of like king queen and so on what i was showing you on slides you can very easily print them so if you have woman man king out of that you compute the queen the computed queen will be slightly off it's not the uh, exactly in the same place but keep in mind we limited the number of dimensions we the the vector embeddings will give you hundreds or thousands of dimensions so you have your text it will be transformed to hundreds of numbers or thousands of numbers in order to print that we had to limit that so we also lose some inf information here but the whole point is that you can very easily uh, use this like using this uh, and writing the code is just yeah probably one screen of a of a code and coming back to rag coming back to vectors why do we w once again why do we want to use them this is the reason this line is the reason we are using chat GPT turbo and we are asking chat GPT what is long chain you know what is long chain we know that Langchain is a framework, like, but, right? But it says Langchain is blockchain-based platform that aims to revolutionize the language learning industry by providing a decentralized market for. You know, it's very convincing, but it's it's complete nonsense. It's complete nonsense because the model was not trained on top of, of on top of any data about the Langchain. It doesn't know about the Langchain. So if we want to implement a chatbot which is talking about Langchain, we need to provide it with, let's say, Langchain documentation. Otherwise, it, it just doesn't know that. And we will try to, to do that, or at least I'll walk you through, through the code which is, which is doing that. So what we are doing here, we are using a bunch of, once again, Langchain helper methods for loading the data from a dictionary, for uh, so we have a bunch of data loaders here, and we say where we want to load the data from because I have I have the data somewhere somewhere here, yeah. We load the data. We actually don't work with the data as is. So there are lots of files in the language uh, in the Langchain documentation. We do a bit of chunking into smaller pieces, and 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 we also do an overlap. Uh, simply because the more data you put into a vector, the less precise it is. So if you think about putting a few sentences into a vector versus putting huge PDF document into a vector, the vector is of fixed size. It has few hundred or few thousand numbers, and the more information you try to squeeze into that, the more information you lose. That's kind of natural, right? So you want to do a bit of splitting, this is arbitrary number. Uh, this is something to you, you need to test we test and and play around with your data. But we are we are loading loading that. We we are transforming the documents, load, transform. 
uh, and then what's important here we are def uh, we are importing once again from Langchain a library called, called Face. I believe it comes from Facebook. So this is not the data vector database per se. It's more of in-memory library, but it allows you to do the transformation and play around with with vectors. But other than that, we are doing something else. Why why would we limit ourselves to vectors? We will use some other retriever. BM25 is the very kind of classical keyword based search. So we are define we will be defining another retriever. So we are defining our vector store. We are defining another retriever on top of our document. So we will be searching based on vectors, but we also will be searching based on keywords simply because we can. And then we define an ensemble of those two retrievers. So we will be getting results from both of them. And if we invoke the retriever with how do I implement retrieval augmented generation rag with lang chain, give me working code examples, it comes up, it basically searches what we have on disk and comes up with a bunch of lines, which, yeah, for instance, this is coming from the file called rag IPNB. And part of the text is one of the most powerful applications enabled by LLMs is sophisticated question answering Q and A chatbots. These are application these are applications that can answer questions about specific sourced information. So this is not an output produced by an LLM. This is basically result of a lookup in the documentation files. This is just a result of a lookup. It's a bit messy. And then we can play, we can show like what scores we are getting and so on. Uh, but what we can do is we can generate, a, create a simple chain, which is doing this retrieval. So we get just top few documents. We print them out. And that will that we define a variable which is basically a string which contains the result of the search. So this is the variable. We have many lines. Some of them are probably useful. Some of them are nah, okay, we won't use it probably. But this is the variable. We'll pass further to another chain. This is the variable, the content of the variable we will pass further to a prompt. So here, we will define a Q&A with context. So we, will, we want the large language model to answer a question with some context provided. Use the following pieces of context to answer the user's question. If you don't know the answer, just say you don't know, don't try to make up an answer. Context and we are passing the variable. So whatever is here will be passed as part of the prompt. So we pull the data and we pass it to the prompt. And then the human message would be, would be just the, the, the standalone question coming from the user and rewritten. And let's say we want to pass it and, and see the results. So we define a chain. We use the prompt we just defined. We pass it to the model. And then we invoke it with, can you explain how retrieval augmented generation works in Langchain? And we pass the context. We pass whatever we pulled from the documentation. And this time, the chatbot is coming up with an answer an answer which is not about blockchain anymore. Retrieval augmented generation in Langchain involves augmenting the knowledge of language model with additional data retrieved from a specific source. This process allows the model to access and incorporate relevant information beyond what it was trained on. So that's exactly what, what, we, what we need. That's exactly what RAG is. And remember, before, when we were, were asking what is Langchain, just the plain model doesn't know that. Langchain is blockchain. 
if we add the context, we get a reasonable answer. Mm. Hold on, okay. Okay, but let me do, let me switch back. Actually, uh, what I think I'll do, we still have some time, so we can try to uh, to do something more. At least, I won't be going into into many details. The the rag is the most important thing you 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 need to understand. We have just just two hours, so we won't be going into details of anything else. But at least I'll try to present you some other, let's say, more advanced concept of dealing with lang chain, dealing with large language models. The first one is called function calling. And the whole purpose of that is, let's think about what we have done so far. So far, we created a prompt and we called it. We got the result. We were able to keep the history. We were able to rewrite the history into, into something more condensed. We were able to provide the model with our own data. So we were able to augment the model knowledge with some external data. But the answer we were getting were always text. And that's fine for a user. The, like if you are a human, you want to get some, some text. You don't want to work, I don't know, with binaries, with JSONs or things like that. But there is another way of working with large language models, which is called function calling. And it's pretty much about defining what function you are, want to call or what structure you want to have as an output. So let's define a knowledge graph, which will consist out of nodes and edges. And an edge is a source, target, label, color. Node is ID, label, color. So we are defining a structure like that. And we would like to tell the, the model that we would like to this type of object as an output. So we are defining an extra helper function for graph visualization for later on. We are reading a single file, an inst instruction file. So we are doing a small rag once again. Um, we are defining a model. This time I'm using the, the 4.0, the recent one. And then we call the model with another function. It's called with structured output. And the structure we expect is the knowledge graph we just defined. So when we invoke that with this prompt, help me understand one, what Langchain is as a detailed knowledge graph based on the content of the markdown file. So we are mixing two things, function calling, because we use this hint with structured output, but also we are doing a super simple rag here because we are providing the content of a file as a context to, to the model. And then what we are getting back, it will be a object instance of a type knowledge graph, so we can visualize that. So if we visualize that, we can see that Langchain consists of Langchain core, Langchain community, and so on. Langchain simplifies development according to the document I sent. Langchain provides an ecosystem which includes LangServe and so on. That all makes sense. That all makes sense to me. That all uh, all is true. So what did we achieve by providing the structure? One obvious th thing is that we don't have to parse some custom text. We just get an object. But I would say that's not the main benefit of using function calling. The main benefit of using structure uh, function calling is that if you define if you have very good definition of the structure of your output and the meaning of your output, then the model can use that information to give you much more precise 
result. So when I was showing you the JSON on the property assistant, it's actually much easier to provide the model with, uh, with an object and the description, what, what is the meaning of each field. And then the, the model will be much more precise with the, um, with the results. The results will be better and it will actually, and it basically it's because it was trained like that. It, it must have been trained on, on many examples like that. And, and the, the, the structure, the, the schema is quite limiting. So it has to basically come up with a result which is fitting the schema. Okay, one more example based on based on general knowledge of the um, of the model is explain to me the full process of manufacturing plastic bottle with all the dependencies and submaterials involved in a detailed knowledge graph. So we are using the same knowledge graph. Okay, okay, that's not easy to. How come it's okay? You have to believe me. <laughs> uh, maybe okay, yeah. So crude oil, natural gas is sent to refinery. They produce those things and so on. I'm not sure if it's true. I haven't verified that. So this is, this is kind of your job to, to verify how well, how well it works. But it's, it's, super nice. it's super nice property that you get a, an object of a specific type. And it's super nice property that it actually, by using well-defined object, the, the precision of the result becomes better. <clears throat> and the last, uh, the last thing I'll very quickly show you, so we are aware of what mechanisms there are, and you can go back home and, um, and implement it yourself, is there are agents and tools. Uh, and let me... So for instance, you can import tools like SQL connectors like Wikipedia, Wikipedia uh, client, and so on. But you can also define your own tools. So here we are defining check weather location, which is giving just a random value, just just to show uh, how you can uh, you can implement your own tool. But other than that, we create an a SQL agent which use this tool, the tool we just defined, to understand the weather. And what we have is we have some travel travel data it's like um airplane airplane kind of uh those are flights okay that's the that's the word i was looking for those are flight details about like uh, and hotel details and flights and stuff like that and then we connect the sql agent to that database and what we can do is we can ask a question, what are the top three recommendations for a sunny trip with cheap hotel departing Basel? So it will use the SQL database to, to do the lookup of what is there. It will also check what's sunny, what's not. So we, the, 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 the two tool we have just defined. And basically it will have like lots of freedom. I mean, this is kind of go bananas, like get, get the tools and, and go bananas. So. Uh, it's good for you know for for showing the the abilities. It's super tricky to to fine tune it, uh, but the point is, end of the day, it's doing it's doing, for instance, a SQL. Is it visible? Should I make it bigger now? Oh my God, where was it? Select from flights where the departure airport. It's aware that it should use this column to to look up for for a specific flight and status scheduled, limit, it, it was also checking for what's sunny, what's not. And it's basically coming up with those, uh, with those questions. You can have a look at what really have happened uh, in, I didn't really run that, I'm just showing you the result, but let me use at the workshop notebook. I haven't run it for a while, hopefully it's still there. So this tool, the Langsmith, is showing you the decision made by uh, by the chatbot, what query was run, that it was uh, some error on the way. Eventually, it runs a query like select from hotels. It gave gave the result. So we won't be going into details now. 
all I want to say that those are kind of abilities. You can use those, but at the same time, it is that the, the more freedom you give to, to the chatbot, it becomes more tricky to control it. So to some extent, it sounds like a nice promise. I'll give you a tool for Wikipedia for for database and, and do the job, but it's not that simple. There is a bit of tuning and then a bit of control on the way. Um, but speaking of tricky bits, let me do a quick summary and then we can we can jump into into the questions. <clears throat> so we were talking about RAG, we were talking about the travel industry, the travel assistant, and this is what a an average website with uh, travel offer, which a kind of vacation rental offer looks like. And the promise from the vector embeddings was that if you search through such a document, you, you get re re result relevant to what you, you are querying. So have a look here. We have a, an, a cottage in Car Cornwall, which is quite cheap. And we have a description of that cottage. The description is already quite long, so it might be too long for putting that into vector embedding. Very likely we will need to cut it into chunks. But if you look at, the, at another listing, like it's completely different. It's completely different from a traveler's perspective. It's not an it's not a cottage, it's an apartment. It's not in Cornwall, it's in London. It's not cheap, it's actually quite pricey. But from the point of vector embeddings, if I take a few of them, I understand that this is not readable. But that's exactly the problem an engineer is dealing with. Because if you get, I don't know, 150 candidates for your query, and each of them has a score of 0.89, and they are completely different from the travelers, uh, traveler's perspective, then you need to do something about it. And why do we have this kind of, this kind of results? Very likely because most of the most of the vector embeddings were trained on general language. So and they understand that the word banana is not the same as car. But but what if we are in banana industry and we are talking about kind of banana specific uh, specific words, specific vocabulary? So that makes it a bit tricky. So the magic does not really exist. There are still tuning you have to do. So first of all, you need to deal with the context length and understand how big chunks will be working better for, for your industry. Longer does not necessarily mean better because it will be more expensive, there will be more noise, and likely you need to cut it into smaller, smaller chunks. Uh, but also you can think about specializing the embeddings. You can train your own embeddings if you have kind of good enough, good enough data and if it's kind of critical, kind of mission critical. But the, one of the secret ingredients is definitely splitting the documents. How exactly? Yeah, like if I, if I show you this, it's a bit too simple. It would be like, okay, draw an owl. You draw two circles and you complete an owl. Too simple, right? So size would matter. The context would matter. What, you, what I mean by context is, let's say you have a PDF document and you take a random chunk of the document. If you don't know what paragraph it's coming from, what section it's coming from, this is this is not very useful. So you need to embed those kind of information. One of the uh, trick I was showing you in the code, there was this overlap. So you can do do at least some overlap between between the chunks. You can, if you identify that, yeah, you are with PDFs. Maybe you can extract the uh, the chapter title and and things like that. And you need to keep that somewhere, either as part of a metadata or as part of the chunk itself. Then there are a bunch of bunch of other techniques you can you can read at uh, our blog. Uh, so this one is about like using using LLMs to to actually do extra verification, so extra LLM calls in the background to to give you better results to to select the better chunks. You need to be aware of tricky formats. I was referring to PDFs uh, multiple times, and 
you know, PDFs is optimized for printing, right? But then when you when you are parsing it, then you get different results depending on what type of PDF you are dealing with. So, so sometimes the trick is to find the right PDF parser. Sometimes you need to do some some custom uh, custom engineering, but uh, but it's not. Uh, sometimes it's not that obvious, but sometimes if you have the PDFs, maybe it's a good idea to think about like, okay, but those PDFs were generated from somewhere. Maybe, maybe you go back to that somewhere, to that database. Maybe it will be easier to work with, with that one. There is really no reason to go to follow the hype. If you have Elasticsearch, just use whatever you have. If you have already a good search engine, just use it. Vector vector embeddings are very useful in certain scenarios. People are talking about them all the times, but there is really no reason not to use other mechanisms if you have them. So if you have some backend database, if you have a data lake, if you have data warehouse, external, internal APIs, just use whatever is useful in your case. Just be quite you can be quite aggressive with the pulling of the documents. You can pull many of them and do a rerun. You can do because searching through millions of documents is is quite tricky. But once you deal with fifty of them, that can, then can, you can apply some heavier technique to to understand which one is more relevant and maybe limit the the number of suggestions you provide to to the LLM. And then, last but not least all kinds of kinds of preprocessing using large language models so i was referring to the elevator quite often and let's say you don't have information whether the property has an elevator in your in your metadata your metadata does not contain that you have that in uh, in the description so yeah you can use llm every single time to understand whether the elevator is there or not but you can also identify that okay, elevator is a common common requirement for for the customers. So you can do the pre-processing of all the descriptions, extract the information you need, store it as metadata. So your search will be faster, your search will be uh, will be cheaper. This kind of brings only benefits. And then. When we are talking about all these kind of splitting the documents, uh, searching, uh, searching for a good information, all of that are leading us to prevent hallucination, to prevent from wrong answers um, coming, coming out from, from large language models, because they, they do come up with wrong answers. The better data you provide to them, the more chance you get the, the right answer. So it's quite often you quite often end up as a search engineer, not a um, kind of AI, uh, AI researcher. But if, you, if good data, if good rag, if good retrieval is not good enough, you can also try techniques like I'll show you here. So there is this library called Nemo Guardrails. And um, you use it as a, as a Python library and you write kind of a code like that where we want to run some verification. So this is just, I mean, I won't go through the details, but it, there is not much code here. Uh, we want to verify if the sentences in the text file, if the answers for those questions will be hallucination or not. And we have two questions. One is, when did the Roman Empire collapse? Did give me the year. So that I expect any model to know about it. This is some common knowledge. There are many materials about that it will know about it. But the other one is how many goals have been scored in Polish Extra Klasa in the season something something. So Polish Extra Klasa, the, the, the Polish football league is not very, very good one. Like people believe at some point it will be, but it's not popular. There are not many materials about that. And asking a question, how many goals has been scored in total? It's not something easy to, to, to even look up if you, if you want to look up for the information. So I don't expect that the model knows about it, but there they have this property that they come up with an answer even if they don't know about it. So let's see. When we ask the question, when did the Roman Empire collapse? Give me the year. The bot response will be 
the Roman Empire officially collapsed in 476. And what the tool is doing behind the scenes, I added some logging. It asks the same question once again. The response is technically the same. It's still 467, but the wording is already different. It was the Roman Empire officially collapsed. Now it's official, fell, officially fell. The wording is different, and the wording is different once again. This time the AD versus CE is, is the only difference. But you cannot do the exact verification or comparison of, of, of the exact output, but you can do some trick to tell that it's not flagged as hallucination. How exactly it's, it happens? Let me show you that on the, on the other example, because that will be more apparent. How many goals have been scored? And the answer from the bot are 1,800, 800, and 700. Probably one of them, <laughs> or a few, at least a few of them, are wrong. So what the tool is doing behind the scene, it's coming up with an extra prompt, which is you are given a task to identify if the hypothesis in agree is in agreement with the context below. We will only use the contents of the context and not rely on external knowledge. And our context are actually the two extra answers we got behind the scene. And our hypothesis is the original question, original answer produced by the chatbot. The bot responds with no, and it is uh -huh, okay, and it is flagged as hallucination. Uh, I wanted to emphasize also about this colon once again. You want yes or no without any extra extra stuff. You add the colon, it, it, it usually works. So it might sound a bit weird because we are using a tool which hallucinates to check if it is a hallucination. But but yeah, this is one of the of the building blocks for your applications. So you do RAG, you do agents, you do uh, function calling, you do these kind of tricks, and you test it, you come up with whatever whatever works with you. You can you can check the, the, the Nemo, Gar Nemo Gardo is because they do lots of tricks like that, so it's nice nice read at least. But when you apply these kind of tricks, you really have to think about the consequences because it's not like, okay, you, you apply something and something works. There will be consequences. One of the consequences is that it will be more expensive. You do extra calls. It will be slower because you do extra calls. You can do them in batch, but then you do an extra prompt to, uh, to, to do the verification for you. What will be the consequence of false positive? Because every now and then it will tell you that this is a hallucination while it's not. So all that are the questions you have to, uh, you have to ask yourself. But all that is kind of becoming more and more complex. You need to work with good retrieval. You need to verify hallucination. And all of that is kind of very much like not AI research job. It's more like a backend data scrapping, data engineering. And we are back to square one. We, we still care even more about data quality. So it's not like, yeah, we have this magic tool and it will be, it will be working because that's, that's the impression you might get from, from, from many kind of LinkedIn, LinkedIn messages. You still care about data quality and the careful engineering will still be necessary if you want to build something complex. There are tools. I mentioned Nem Nemo guardrails. There is Langsmith I was showing you. Um, there is, for instance, Weaviate, which is the, the vector database. And there are tools but if you have this approach, just shut up and take my money, the tool will solve my problem. No, that will not work. That will not work because the whole industry is quite, quite new. The tools are still improving. The tools are still, still building and it's even hard to, hard to judge what to bet on. Uh, this is a slide, this is the screenshot from Langchain code changes, and that shows you that there is lots of them, lots of removal, lots of addition. And on one hand, it's a, it's a good thing because the, 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 it's improving 
there is a community behind that and uh, and it's growing but on the other hand you have to whichever tool you are using you have to expect some breaking changes you just have to be prepared of that for that you have to have good monitoring to spot those problems and so on then testing yeah testing of that is uh is super tricky so i would say test whatever is deterministic because that you can do so if you are building a backend application then you are used to the situation that you write a function two plus two it should be four and it will be four and if you do an extra feature you run hopefully your 200 tests hopefully all of them are green so you have quite good confidence that you didn't break anything here it's not that easy here you definitely should test whatever is deterministic like retrieval like all the databases call and, and stuff like that but other than that you can try and probably you should test uh, the llm actions but since they are not deterministic you can apply tricks like i showed you with um with uh, nemo guardrails with the hallucination check you can verify if for a specific chain of of course, the, the meaning of the output is what you expect or not, but it is tricky and you definitely need to collect the data about the previous calls and, and use them in, in your verification and, and, uh, and some level of monitoring is, is necessary from, from day one because probably if you build this kind of system, you will not release it at once probably you will release it to, to a small fraction of your customers you collect the feedback probably in the first days you will be kind of eyeballing through what was going on it's good to give the customers kind of thumbs up thumbs down uh, and, and the ability to uh, to collect the feedback from them as well uh, this is a good read so i was talking about the determinist multiple times but they uh, they explain why the models are not deterministic and they probably will never be it's about the hardware it's about like uh, and it's also about two tokens can have exactly the same probability and what you can do about it then, then so far we've been mostly talking about open ai because that's the that's the leader that's the industry leader in some cases, it's tempting to use open source, but you have to be aware that the out of the box open source is still behind. And it's kind of, I'm sad to say that because I really like working with open source. It, it's, it's great, it's, it's, you understand what, what are you actually using, but you need to be aware that they are behind. You can do fine tuning of them, but it's super tricky in a sense that most companies don't have good enough quality data for for doing the fine tuning data will always be the key whether it's for fine tuning or for the rag you need to have good data you need to provide the model with good data whichever uh, whichever model you are using and i would say don't start with fine tuning it's tempting it's like oh yeah let's do data science but uh, retrieval is your way of starting i would say it's the most practical one that allows you to understand what problems you are facing maybe you can f fix the problem with just retrieval maybe you can understand that customers really need something else and it's good to know about it early without and a huge investment and then the other reason people are considering open source llms is the privacy because what we are doing if we are building an application which process gets some data and processes the data and then send it to an LLM you have to be aware that that data is being sent to the third party and depend on how sensitive your data is you might do that you might be fine but it might be that it's completely not acceptable and if you are dealing with sensitive data some companies are like no 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 we won't go to any API we want to have our own infrastructure we want to have our own open source models so if the api is not possible you need to have your private llm private hardware but that also means you need your own embedding model you need to have your own vector db so everything 
all the ecosystem should be should be private. I mean, it's not a rocket science, but it complicates things. It it adds some some maintenance. And then, when we are talking about open source, we can usually think, okay, it's cheaper. I don't pay for the license, but the open source world with LLM is weird in many in many in many senses. First of all, it's not necessarily cheaper because you will have huge investment up front for, for the infrastructure. And if you are doing a POC, you don't know if it will be if it will be worth it or not. Um, it will be more expensive in a sense you will need extra maintenance and probably you will need to spend much more time in uh, in kind of fine tuning the application. So an example we've had was we started with Llama, Llama 2, the small, yeah, the small one, to, to be honest. But we started with Llama um, because the client was reluctant of sending the data to OpenAI. But then at some point he was like, yeah, yeah, go for, go for OpenAI. And the, like, we spent like two weeks on tuning something in Llama which worked so-so while the, the good function calling in OpenAI fix the problem like that. So the, the open source might require you to do extra work in order to, to make it work. Uh, other than that, open source is weird in the sense that if you use, I don't know, Postgres, Cassandra, Spark, whatever, you go to the code, you see the code, you can change the code, you can build it locally, you can branch out. Here, you, you get a binary, you get a binary, but you don't know what data it was trained with, and probably you don't have resources to, to, to do anything except of uh, a bit of fine tuning. You, you, you are not able to branch out and do something super fancy because basically you don't have resources. So in that sense, that's a completely different world. And speaking of costs, yeah, you, you have a kind of uh, price, uh, price table. Actually, this is a bit outdated because there, there is 4.0, um, which is a bit cheaper. But the point is, GPT, when you compare 3.5 versus 4, it tends, ten, it's still 10 times cheaper. So that's, you know, order of magnitude. And this is something you need to be, be aware of when you are deciding which model, uh, which model to go for, what kind of traffic you expect. But with with APIs, it's still relatively uh, re relatively easy because you can do back of the envelope calculation at least. You need to be remember that the input tokens have different price than the output tokens. You need to be aware that token in OpenAI is something different than token in Anthropic because they use different tokenizers, so the number of token tokens might differ. It won't be huge difference, but in some cases that might matter. To make it a bit more confusing, token versus characters. Um, OpenAI charges you for tokens, but uh, Gemini is charging you for characters. But it becomes the, the math becomes a bit more complex when you go for uh, for the open source. You need to calculate the hardware cost. You need to predict what traffic you will have, and if you have super low traffic. The investment into hardware would mean that your each and every request would be much more expensive. If you have big traffic, then maybe it, it is justified. So with cost calculation, it's not that obvious whether open, uh, whether, whether, whether open source is cheaper or not. One of the main, main reasons to go for open source is, is, is privacy, not, not really the cost. And yeah, I hope I didn't sound too grumpy because I was talking about what's not working, but I, I want you to be, to be aware of that. You need, need to be aware of the risks, cost, various models has various licenses and stuff like that. But I hope, I hope you, you get a feeling of what you, can, what you can achieve, what you can do, but you will also be, uh, be aware of. It's actually quite quite nice job. There is lots of experiments involved, and and like if you like experimenting, that's super nice. But at the same time, make sure you don't get stuck with this 
constant experiment mode because it should lead to some to some business value and you need to to be pragmatic about that we have some time quite some time for questions but before we do questions i i, I would really like to ask you to to do the survey and i know if i just leave it you won't do that so i'll give you a minute to do that and then we'll jump into questions please do that i really appreciate it That was enough time, right? OK, nice. OK, 10 more seconds and we can continue. OK, there is a question in the back of the of the room. Okay, and meanwhile, you can scan the other two QR codes. I would be very happy to talk to you after the presentation as well, but in case you prefer LinkedIn for some reason, let's stay connected. Uh, and there is, a, there is a newsletter we will be starting, so if you would like to hear about these kind of tips and tricks, you can also sign up. But now, I'm all yours. I'm happy to talk. Yeah, thank you very much for your uh, talk. It was really interesting and I learned a lot of new things, especially the trick with the colon at the end mm -hmm. that was new to me. Um, yeah, question is about uh, vector databases. Uh, do you, uh, there are a lot of products nowadays available that specialize in that to be a vector database, but uh, existing databases like Postgres also have support for vectors with PG vectors and so on. Uh, do you really see a need for a dedicated vector database or might uh, a Postgres extension like PG vector, if you have Postgres, might be sufficient? Okay, that's a, that's a very good question. We've been using, uh, we've been using Weaviate mostly because it was, uh, we started with, er, uh, at early days and our main decision factor was they have an API, but they also have the, the open source version so you can install it yourself and, and we, ha we had various projects and for some projects it was necessary to have the private version. But I would say these days, if you, if, especially if you are starting, I would say go for Postgres, especially if you have the Postgres in your, in your installation, there is no reason not to try. Um, there are always kind of this tricky kind of maybe a bit academ academic question of like which, which one is better because it's not only about the, uh, which one is faster, but it's also which one gives you a better result. You have to be aware that if you are dealing with vectors and look up for, for a specific vector, it's, it doesn't work in the same way as regular database. It doesn't work like a B3 in a database when you have an index, you are looking for John, it gives you John. It will, it, it, it's an approximate algorithm, so those, the, the, the implementation details of the, those algorithms might differ, but I expect like for most of the cases, it, it won't matter that much. Okay. So I would start with Postgres. Um, I think mi microphone, can you have? So it will be recorded as well. Thank you. You talked about testing and the fact that it's difficult because the result is not always deterministic. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you are doing some hack and really uh, teaching some specific documents, isn't it worth it to test anyway, to check that at least some basic results stay the same? But 
can you give me a bit more about uh, a bit a bit more specifics about what what use case you have in mind? Uh, I, I don't know if you give an internal documentation mm -hmm. uh, as a rag, and you want to be sure that uh, answers to basic questions stay correct in the time, mm -hmm. uh, and also knowing that the model evolves. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I'm wondering w when it's worth to automate tests so that you you are aware if something doesn't work anymore. Okay. And when it's not. Okay, but but the tests you can actually automate quite quite easily. So one of the w when I was showing you the the UI, we had this button fix it and uh, thumbs up. The fix it meant it needs to be taken care of the engineer because we can see a problem with that. But if we had the thumbs up or, or it was a button like add to automatic tests, we basically take store store the input, we store the output. And we, we come up with a prompt which basically checks if the if we replay that in the future after the changes, if it will be if it will have the same meaning or not. So in that sense, adding like the baseline tests it is quite easy. You know, it's still it's it's still every now and then you will have a false, false, uh, false positive, false negative. Uh, but but it is quite easy. But when you are talking about internal documents, it's also it also depends on how mission critical the system is because if you are dealing with internal documents which human is reading later on and um and you get get the reference to to to, to the source then you can assume that even if uh if the and if the system works well enough you probably will spot that there are problems if they if your employees are using the system if you are if it's customer facing and if um, if if it's a public system which which is customer facing and you will have many users and and, and so on, you don't want to to have you want to limit the number of mistakes. In some cases, you you, you afford to, to to take some risk simply because it's internal usage and you assume your your colleagues, your employees are are still thinking, are not assuming that everything which is coming from from the system is not. Uh, is uh, is perfect but speaking of that i forgot to show you one thing so at this url you can pretty much play with with a bit better version of what i was showing you so what we were doing we were uh we were implementing a rag on top of langchain documentation they actually have that public and if you ask some questions they give you they give you answer, but they also ref, ref, uh, refer to, to the source they used. So what was the result of their lookup and so on. So it, a, lot, a lot will depend on how exactly you present uh, the results to, to your colleagues and what exactly are the expectation. If they understand that the system can make mistakes, maybe you can create a very quick kind of dirty version, check if it if, if it's helpful for them, how often it, it makes mistakes, and iterate from there. Okay, hello. Thank you, Martin. It was really impressive. I have just one question about um, maybe cool things. It's about uh, uh, hallucinations. I'm really interested to, to know if the hallucination can be useful for us. If we, we ask the, the LLM to be in hallucination mode to, to have some more creativity other than just uh, providing correct and accurate answer. Is it is it a topic, is it useful to, to deal with that in your, is, is there any use case to, to do that? Um, so we've been actually increasing the temperature in some, uh, some of the tests just to, just to see how, how the chatbot will respond with different temperature how and how um, good or bad the, the answers will be, because simply because we wanted to see to what extent the context is used. Because when you are dealing, uh, when you are dealing with uh, with answers from from the chatbot, and you are dealing with RAG, it's good to verify if it's really using the context, or maybe it just has this knowledge. Maybe it already has this knowledge and it's not using the context. At all, so it's good to play with that when you when you are doing verification with, with tests. So, so it's not only for you know creative writers; it's also about 
to, to, to see to what extent it's using the um, the context you provide, to what extent it's it's um, consistent with the outputs. Uh, just a question about uh, you mainly use a model from OpenAI, and I guess that you define the token in the environment or something like this. Say again. You you set on uh, the token in the environment variable. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. At the beginning, and uh, I want to ask uh, if um, you are using other models. Uh, does it support a serving model uh, like a VLLM uh, or uh, or Lama? Lama Lama is definitely supported. Yes. And VLLM does it? Support? That I don't know, but I, I guess yes because if you if you check the community if you check the community package from Langchain you can you get connectors to all kind of tools which I've never really heard of. So I believe like when it gets to LLMs um, they are they are uh, supported. That's my guess. And is there any big difference with uh, Lama index? Lama index. I don't know if you know. No, I'm not sure. It's nearly the same functionality that you have in Lama Index, and uh, mm -hmm. just want to know if. Uh, I mean, we've 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 been using this one, so okay. hard to <laughs> hard, hard to say. It works. It works for us, and and the community is great. But but I don't I don't know. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I could have hallucinated, but I won't. Maybe one question as well. You we we speak about. Uh, Passing PDF, and uh, I'm thinking about especially uh, this is a complex ta task, obviously, especially for complex PDF. Uh, complex PDF is with a table of content, uh, big columns, uh, a <coughs> lot of tables, diagram, and so mm -hmm. on. So we know that maybe LLM may help to um, to pass this PDF. Do you have any experience with uh, this uh, very specific task? And what kind of tool you may recommend to do that? Okay, so that very much depends on what exactly is the goal and what types of document you are dealing with. Because we've been talki talking to a customer which came to us and he said, "Oh, I want to see what's the potential of this super comp of understanding this super complex document about gas and energy re regulation in Poland." And it was like. 160 pages of a document I, I don't understand, right? So if you put that document just to the OpenAI playground, if you if you click on the left-hand side somewhere in the chat GPT, they have a playground and they allow you to upload upload the document and behind the scene they uh, they do some magic, some rag uh, to to extract the documents. You can see that out of the box, without you know any coding even, they you get you get five questions. Two of them, uh, you get the answer right away. One of them is complete nonsense, and the other two are technically correct, but not helpful at all. So you definitely, if you build something custom, you definitely can handle these kind of documents. And w I was showing that that to the to the customer. But then my next question was, but why it's 160 pages? You are an expert in the field. Do you really need to build that? How many people will be using that? And he was like, uh, yeah, 30, 30 people. So, so it's a question if you want, uh, who will be your end target? What are your expectations from, from them? Will they just trust it blindly or will they think about uh, the output? Will, will they check the source? Um, and, and yeah, those are, those are all, and, and what, how many of those documents you have? Do you have, just one? Do you have millions of them? Are they looking similarly, or every every single document is a corner case? So those are the questions you need to need to ask. Because I would say everything is doable, but it's also a question about like the the, the business purpose and and the the business value of of implementing that. We we had in mind uh, um, financial product documentation, mm -hmm. so we have a lot of this kind of document and they are all looking very similar mm -hmm. and uh, these documents are for uh, retail so basically they could be read by a lot of people and basically we are checking the um, compliance of this kind of document so oh, okay so they, if they if they look very similar i would definitely give it a try 
I would I would have a look what's what's doable within a day. I was, would look into what what's doable within two weeks. Just just give it a try. It's it's fun. Thanks. Was a question. All right. Thank you very much.